Do you like to manually steer your tires with your hands every time you're out on the rocks? Or do you prefer to have a steering servo do the work for you? Since you're tuned into my YouTube channel, I'm just going to take a wild wager that you probably have a steering servo in your radio control car. And today we're going to talk about steering servos. I'm going to try to not go too in depth. I'm just going to talk about the different types, how they work, you know, the basics. As I stare into your soul. So what we have here is a servo installed into an RC car. I know it's a, a very novel concept. And this servo installed on the front of this Element Enduro, it is called a, uh, let's see, CMS, chassis mounted servo. There's also, uh, let's see, how do we, how do we used to say it? axle mounted servo AMS yeah that's right nobody talks about AMS these days and there's very few rigs that actually come with axle mounted servos the rift would be one I mean let's just look around a couple of comp rigs here and there uh, man the market has really gone to all chassis mounted servos so it actually mounts in the chassis when the chassis moves the servo moves with it uh, exception would maybe be this old comp rig bastard junior as you can see servo is mounted on the axle itself so first, let's just talk about the benefits of each of those mounting schemes. With a chassis mounted servo, you get a nice clean look on the suspension here. Uh, as you can see, you can't see the servo on the axle. So it looks more like a real rig, a scale rig. Now, the downside of the chassis mounted servo is that when your suspension cycles, you can have what's called bump steer. And let's, uh, let's just see, honestly, the, the element has such great suspension geometry that it's got practically no bump steer, if any at all. Um, so on a bad rig, at least, when you would articulate one of the axles, the tires would actually turn with it, and that's called bump steer. Uh, if you hit a bump, it steers, literally is why it's called that. And on all the newer rigs, the, the steering geometry is so great. Uh, you know, the TRX-4, the SEX-10-2, the Element, just to name a few of them that are out there that have absolutely fantastic steering geometry. The chassis mounted servo isn't really that bad of a, uh, of a compromise. Uh, it, it looks great. It gets your uh, center of gravity, you know, pretty low. It's just, it's just easy to work on, to tell you the truth. I like the way that it looks and it performs well enough these days. So we won't cover that anymore. But let's cover a, different, a couple different types of servos. So um, at Holmes Hobbies, we, we only carry higher quality goods. So all we have are brushless servos. But brush servos are actually a pretty big part of the market. Uh, brushed, I think I said that right. Brushed are the big part of the market, they're the lower cost ones. Brushless are the more expensive, higher power ones, the ones that I tend to keep in my store. So something like the stock tracks of servo, that's gonna be a brushed one. Uh, these, I can tell you from experience, if you have it sitting on the rocks and it's under load, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of side load or whatever, they'll actually burn themselves out. Um, not only due to, to the inefficiency of them, but also because a lot of these lower cost servos don't have amp limiting on there. The only way that they can make the torque is by essentially stalling out the motor as much as you possibly can. So it's this, uh, this interesting juxtaposition of trying to have a powerful enough servo, uh, low enough resistance of motor is, is what it really boils down to, but also having it not so powerful that it burns itself out in a bind. Really tough to do, honestly, but it's also the cheapest way to manufacture them. And if you're talking a, you know, a $40 and under servo, most of those aren't gonna have amp limiting, not all, uh, but most aren't gonna have amp limiting and they're all gonna be brushed, uh, either coreless or different types. Uh, that's kind of more than, than we need to get in here today. The other type are going to be brushless ones. And I mean, even for the weight, you can feel that the brushless ones, you know, they have more motor inside. Um, this one is an all metal case. So the, the case itself is going to be heavier. This one also has a five gear layout, which makes it even beefier, even heavier and a brushless servo. All three of these models have brushless motors inside. And it's, it's just like your, your regular old speed controller and motor that we have in this rig that makes it go. You have your brushless motor on the inside of your servo. And then you actually have a little motor speed controller. But instead of having a, a normal feedback like this guy to where I tell it to go forwards and it goes forwards and I tell it to go backwards and it goes backwards, on a servo, you give it a position 
and the servo knows where it is. And so it will ramp the torque up and down through pulse width modulation. Technically it's ramping the applied voltage, but uh, again, I'm trying not to get into too heavy of the weeds here. Uh, you give it a position to hit, it knows what position that is, and it will vary the pulse width modulation to increase or decrease the torque and thus the amp draw of trying to move to that location. And so the larger error that we have between the position that you're telling it to be in and the actual position of it, the larger that error, the more power that the control circuitry would give. It's actually called a servo driver, surprise, surprise. Um, a servo mechanism in all industries is essentially a closed loop positioning device. And, uh, you know, it's going to have power to it because it moves your position of whatever it is. CNC machines have these, uh, all sorts of equipment in the world has servo motors or servo positioning devices in them. So it's not just for crawlers, but we just, we just call them servos, um, kind of, kind of a, a lazy way of going about it. But so that's, that's how they work. The brushless ones, because brushless don't have brushes in the way, they make more torque, they make more power, they run more efficiently, they run cooler. And because you're already spending extra money off them, a lot of them these days also have amp limiting built into them, which means that I can get this thing and, and uh, well, I can, I can break the suspension uh, or break the pan hard mount. You can, you can see it flexing here because my servo doesn't want to move. It's got so much torque that I'm, I'm just bending the plastics that are all around it on the suspension setup. Our three, or, you know, our pan hard mount, our three link mount, you know, everything is kind of like moving out of the way because the servo doesn't want to move. So the servo driver controls the motor. The brushless ones are going to be higher dollar, but also have better amp limiting control, better heat control, uh, you know, better torques all the way around. The brushless ones are the higher quality choices to go with. So now let's talk about the other two types. So we have brushed and brushless. Uh, we have the uh, direct power and we have what's now called HV, which is just a lower power version. So again, two examples. Our stock servo from Traxxas. This would be a regular voltage servo, which typically you don't want to put out more than six volts into it. And you're going to have to power this uh, with an external BEC or an ESC that has an integrated one. That'll be a topic for another day. But today we're just going to talk about these guys. So you run it at more than six volts. Like I said, this one doesn't have amp limiting. So it's going to run a little hotter than running it at, let's say, 5.5. If you run it at 7.4 volts, which would be... Uh, what they considered to be, you know, high voltage a decade ago or whatever the case, more than likely this Traxxas servo is going to, it's going to burn up pretty fast too. Uh, but it'll survive if you treat it right. Now, a true two cell LiPo direct input is actually 8.4. And that's what a lot of them are called these days was HV. And as you can see, there's just a single wire. It, it plugs directly into your radio, your BEC is powering this through your actual radio the traces inside of your receiver box itself and you know like i said a lot of these these lower lower cost ones they don't have amp limiting and so if you did bump it up to 7.4 it's probably gonna burn out uh, you bump it up to 8.4 you're definitely gonna burn these little guys out because they're really not made for more than six volts now you go up to something that is uh, more expensive. Let's just say that this was an 8.4 volt version. It's actually uh, a three cell, four cell version. But um, the more expensive ones, they're gonna be designed to run on that 8.4 volts. It's pretty much across the industry these days. Anything that's got HV on it, you can run at 8.4 volts. And the nicer ones, the brushless ones, they do have that amp limiting. So as you increase the voltage, you do increase the power, but it hits a point to where it, it won't actually ask for more power. It'll, it'll just, you know, get out of the way. If you stall the servo, the servo will, eh, you know, I'm not going to give it more amperage because I know it's going to burn me out. So uh, they are smart enough these days, at least with the more expensive ones, that they simply won't ask for more power than they know that they can handle with the higher dollar ones. But again, this, you know, this would be the equivalent of an HV, the 8.4 volt. So uh, I forget how many years ago now, maybe four or five years, I came out with the SHV servo. And I called it SHV because super high voltage. If 8.4 is high voltage, then 11.1 or 14.4 or 16.8 or, you know, whatever it's rated for, which mine are all rated for four cell and three cell. And you can actually run them on two cell as well if you want something that's kind of slow and pokey. Uh, I called them SHV. And 
I don't know if there's other brands that are calling them SHV at this point. It, I, I want to say that I saw some, some of them out there, but these are typically characterized by having two power leads. One of them is a JST. This is a uh, female plug male pin side on the servo. And then you have your radio plug that goes on there. And I say typically characterized by that. This is how I originally designed all the SHV servos to be pinned and the entire market has adopted it. It's actually fairly common now to have these SHV super high voltage servos that you can run on three and four cell directly. Not all companies, some of them, you, they, they tap out at 14 volts because it's actually better if you want to run on three cell, you don't want to tune it for four cell. So a lot of these companies are tuning them for three cell and they max out at 14 volts and, and you can't run them on four cell or they just burn up. Uh, but some companies like my own, you can run them on four cell directly as well. And boy, they're, they're fun on four cell. They, they really, they really get it. Now, some of these SHVs, at least my brand, I don't know if uh, anybody else is doing this yet. They have a standard lead, so you can run them at the lower HV voltages through your, uh, your radio. This actually boots up at 5.5. We call it six volts just to give us a little, little safety margin on there. But they come with another little adapter, which I have seemingly misplaced for myself for the sake of this video. Oh, maybe over here. Yeah, here we go. Bam. Uh, so we come with this adapter. You plug that in and now there's your JST and there is your radio signal right there. Um, so just as an acceptable way of powering it. Um, however, we did find out when you get to a certain high power level, having this extra RX plug in there, we have one RX plug, we have two RX plugs in there. When you get to the extra high power that these guys will pull, having that extra plug in there is actually not a good idea on, so, on some of our higher power models. We're actually going to go back to this, uh, you know, four wire or, or two wire method, whatever you want to call that as. Uh, so. Not quite industry standard. Uh, there, there's probably going to we're probably going to see different ways of companies doing it in the future. I certainly hope so. I love to see innovations from other other companies. Competition breeds innovation, and that is always what we want to see. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about is the servo spline. This is actually going to be relatively important for you. Now, fortunately, almost everybody in the industry has gone to that 25 tooth Futaba compatible spline. <laughs> Futaba. Um, and that's really nice. It was one of the better ones to tell you the truth. And, uh, even high tech. So high tech had the 24 tooth, I think for a long time. And then there were some other companies that did 23 tooth and everybody's like fighting over their own standards. They, 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 they nobody wanted to work together. So what I have seen though, is that high tech is now coming out with a 25 tooth spline. I guess they figured they lost that fight. And it's kind of nice that almost everything in the industry now has standardized that 25 tooth spline. But you should be aware when you buy a servo and when you buy the servo horn for it, because if you're upgrading, you're probably going to need to upgrade a servo horn too, that you need to make sure that your spline is correct. It needs to match. It needs to be the same tooth count. And then hopefully the, uh, the tolerances between the factory for the servo and the factory for the servo horn are close enough that they fit without either being too loose or too tight because both of those are a problem. And that's, you know, that could be said for anything on a crawler, anything on any rigs. There's going to be tolerances that you have to deal with sometimes. So I hope that explains servos a little bit. If you do have more specific questions, leave them down below. I'll either try to get to them or I will do a more in-depth video down the road once we get through our basic series of electronics. But as you can see, I'm only running three cell on this SHV 500 LP. The LP stands for low profile, nice shorty little servo. As you can see here, nice and short. Uh, plenty of torque on this rig. Like, you know, if I, if I try to hold this, it just bends all the plastics. It's overpowered for this rig, but still plenty, plenty fast. And that's one of the advantages that the SHV has is that it can have pretty high torque and also blazingly fast speeds at the same time. Just from amp efficiencies, uh, I could get into the MOSFETs and some other components, but I think I should probably wait for later on that. That's, uh, that's a deep dive into the hows and whys of certain servos. So, I hope that helped and I hope you have more questions than what maybe you started with on this video and I will do my best to help you out in that regard. So as always, thanks for tuning in and have a great day.